Rocking out, man. That's the mad school for the jingle. There you go. I business. need that singer in my band. <laughs> that's my wife. No, oh, there you go. She's oh, yeah, right. she's really good. Yeah. I think that's my first ever personalized jingle as well. So, oh, uh, good. I'm, good. I'm I'm uh, only flattered. <laughs> oh well, listen. Thanks for doing this. And as it says in the jingle, modern blues royalty is an example, right? Of of uh, for anybody who's watching, really. I mean, you're too humble to take us on board. I think, but. I've got a column in Guitar Te Techniques magazine, and I was told um, the people I should focus on. So it's basically a bunch of lessons without taking licks, without infringing or copyright. So I'm just writing a lesson, sort of trying to get inside the idea of somebody's style whilst, whilst not replicating any exact licks. Yeah. So the order was Larry Carlton, do, do something on him. Robin, uh, sorry, T-Bone Walker, Larry Carlton, Robin Ford, you. Oh. that was the order so that is the the you know the way you're thought of over here I'm well quite that's nice. that's uh very nice i'm i'm definitely a uh post robin uh blues player so uh he, he uh definitely when i was a teenager set us down the path that we uh that we uh found ourselves still on so uh yeah that's nice to be always nice to be in, included there yeah I'll tell you what, you did a workshop years ago. I used to work at ACM. I used to do some teaching down there. You did a workshop. And um, that was the first time I'd ever heard anybody do it, use a two rock. I thought, what is, um, what is this sound apart from the, the, the language? And there was one thing you mentioned, which was the, the not the, the single, the, the full version of Voodoo Child, the blues. Yeah. Talking about that, and you were really into that at that time. And I've heard you mention that in more recent interviews. And it's it's really really interesting to think of your style, all the things that go in it. I'm sure everybody's got an idea of what they think went into it. And I know a lot of people have interviewed you and and, and uh, picked your brains about influences. But that blend of styles is what I really want to get into. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm looking over here like a loon. I'm looking at my other screen, and there's a. There's a slow blues, a chorus of a slow blues of yours. I transcribed from that teaching video you did a few years ago, the pre-True Fire days, the, the Hal Leonard DVD. And oh yeah, that's a while back now. Yeah, man, it's I mean, lovely, lovely playing, but thank you, freezing in the tone. I I, I doubt anybody sold more two rock amps than you have. I mean, it's, <laughs> well, John Mayer probably has helped. Well, as well, John Mayer has probably sold sold but, quite uh, a few. But, I'm, I'm part of the furniture at Two Rock these days, and we, you you know, a couple of my best friends own it. Actually, one of them worked there since the beginning when I was with them, and uh, one of them ended up buying it uh, about six years ago. Right. when uh, they were the previous owners had kind of not taken it in the right direction, and so a friend of mine who's already a friend of mine, he calls me and says. Uh, I've just bought two rock. Um, <laughs> I haven't told my wife yet. Oh, uh, but I needed to tell you. <laughs> so, uh, Eli. So he's a great, he's a great friend. And Mac, who was there from the beginning. So yeah, that's been 2005. I got my first two rock. So I think right. probably right around the same time as John Mayer was uh, getting involved with them. And um, they're better than ever. I'll be honest. They, they, they're the best they've ever been. Yeah. So, well, I think it makes a difference having a, a really good player own the thing i mean it's that's yeah it's all about he, intention, isn't it if you mean it's all about intention i think if you mean business it's what comes out is going to be good yeah eli is, is a great player and he's just one of those sleeps four hours a night kind of guys and uh so he's super driven about it and he's also a big much like me you know we both grew up on vintage fender amps for many years first and uh so we still love those and he's got a collection of those as uh, of, of some you know all the cool old stuff so he's brought more of that flavor back into the two rock thing so now it's perfect for me because back when i first started i i loved the two rock but i missed my old super reverb you know and but i didn't want to tour with it and uh now i uh, 
them because the, the you get all of it at once with the current two orgs. Nice, nice. Oh well, yeah. My wife would like to thank you for all that gear last year. <laughs> I, I've never done it, but one day I may rob a bank one day and get one. Yeah. Amazing time. So I mean, what I where I want to go with this is to think: well, how does everything come together? So if you if I go back to Hendrix, then what do you, if you had to explain what you got from Hendrix? What would you say? Well, first of all, literally the minor pentatonic scale, because when I was trying to, I was thirteen in my bedroom. Um, I am in my family's bedroom right now. It wasn't this specific one, but something like this. Um, but uh, I, 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 uh, I was trying to work out the intro to the Wawa version of Voodoo Child on my three quarter inch nylon string um, student guitar. That's all I had, yeah. and uh, uh, I learned the intro, figured it out by ear, and accidentally learned the minor, pent minor pentatonic in E. So from there, I was like, "Oh, so this sounds like all the other stuff I'm trying to figure out." Once I had that down, so literally the minor pentatonic I learned from Hendrix. But other than that. The thing with him is just um, it's so real and so, you know, just I can't even explain it. But it, he's first of all, all my favorite guys are beyond the instrument itself. So um, and I listen to a lot of non guitar music as well. So, but it's not really, you know, obviously Jimmy's tones were amazing and it's his facility on the instrument but he could have been a saxophone player or a piano player or you know so what you're hearing is an artist mm. uh, who's happened to use the guitar as their medium he could have been a painter do you know what i mean it's it, that's what i think of all my favorites and hendrix is a perfect example of that it just so happens that the guitar was the medium he ended up with um so it was that he was the first. So my dad wasn't into Hendrix. All the other stuff I was growing up on, and the first stuff I heard, and the first stuff I tried to play unsuccessfully, was the original blues guys, like the guy I've randomly chosen to have on my T-shirt today. But BB was my first hero. Um, um, so my dad was like more traditional electric blues. So that's what I'd heard. And then I, when I heard Hendrix, it was just so wide open. And perhaps because I was younger. And it was a different time, late 80s, early 90s. That appealed to me massively, how it was just Jimi Hendrix music. And there were several important things that that I kind of came across at the time, which made me feel like I could do this because BB was my first hero. And I had this VHS set I would watch every day, every morning before school. And, and there was a few songs taped off the TV, off like the Tube TV show or something in the 80s. But I couldn't ever figure out how I could be B.B. King, if you know what I mean. It was like so majestic. I was just in awe. But where do you start? And as a little 13-year-old uh, kid in uh, in the Cotswolds at this point, in Gloucestershire, you know, I don't know. So somehow guys like Jimmy and especially when I saw Stevie Ray playing with B.B. King as well, I th I thought... Well, maybe there's a way you can do this yourself, you know, that um, is not, it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, the same as what came before, you know, um, it can be your own version of it. Mm -hmm. And so that would reply right on up to then hearing Robin as a, as a teenager later when I was about 15 or 16. And it's like, Oh, so you really can just do something you whatever you like with this, and then, and as long as the feel is right, it's still the blues. So that's that's all those guys were they were original, and and uh, obviously no one uh, more than Hendrix. It just blew blew the doors open. Just to put a point on on him, the thing I always say about him is it's like he there was a glass ceiling on guitar playing really that nobody else saw, mm. and. He just he just bust through it, and you know, in some cases, you, uh, uh, the glass shattered everywhere. And as they say, what you've got to break a few eggs to make an omelet, right? So some of the kind of more out there stuff that happens with Jimmy, or sometimes it gets a bit crazy and messy on some of the live stuff. But somebody had to do that for the rest of us. Yeah. That, that, that ever since the rest of us can just come along and go, oh well, I'll just use that, you know, and and take. And it's to say, all these guys, BB, T Bone that you mentioned and stuff, they all contributed uh, a, a huge piece of a of a sound, 
that now the rest of us can just you know grab and go oh, i'll take a bit of that i'll take a bit of albert collins but they have these singular styles and yeah. uh, so they did all the hard work for us those guys it's one thing learning to play guitar like them it's another thing to invent the music you yeah. know yeah yeah i mean i'm just looking at this solo it's a, as i said it's um it's one chorus of a slow blues from your teaching video i mean it seems to me i mean there's stuff you think oh that kind of is sort of like this is sort of like that you know you think you might be able to to make comparisons but i wonder my question is really did you sort of craft a style do you ever remember particularly thinking i i can't play exactly like those guys i'm going to make a deliberate effort or yeah. did, did you just grow organically? Because I know you played a lot from when you were a kid. Yeah. Well, first of all, I did play with other... I, music has always been about playing in a band for me. So from the minute I decided I want to play at 13, I put I got a band together at school. And I everything was learned in the context of playing in a band with other musicians, mm -hmm. which is really important. And I'm probably like the last garage band generation where we just got together and hashed it out and didn't know what we were doing, but we loved it. Yeah. You know, it was as simple as that. But very much so for me. So when I mentioned seeing Stevie Ray playing with BB, it was a video. So 13, it's about two weeks before Stevie died, actually. Uh, and I just discovered him. And it was BB King, Albert Collins and Stevie Ray Vaughan with Stevie's band playing Texas Flood at the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. You can go on YouTube and look it up now. Uh, but back then I had managed to get a hold of uh, captured this off TV on VHS. And um, what struck me as much as how much, uh, other than how much I just loved it, was how different they all were. And and then I realized, well, there's three guitar players. They're not even, it, none of them are in the same tuning. So BB's in standard, Stevie's in E flat, and Albert Collins is in F minor. Right. And I realized then, I'm like, you have to have something to say of your own. And there's a beautiful moment in it when BB takes a solo and they give him two choruses because he's the king. And so all deference to the king. And then he looks over at Stevie that he's finished his solo. And Stevie's first line is like a Stevie Ray version of a BB King lick as like a kind of baton pass or something, you know, like a, 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 and a thank you and a, an acknowledgement of I listened, I hear you. And then um, then he goes into his usual kind of more Albert Kingy Stevie stuff, you know. Yeah. And it so right then I was like, oh, you got to have something to say. Um, and um, so I always that's always been still the goal is to get it down to what do I most sound like? You know, I've actually had this conversation with uh, with Robin, you know, because I've been compared to him a lot over the yeah. years. And it was very important. But a lot of that's he was important to me going down a certain path. But it was his approach as much as anything um, that. Uh, influence me not so much specific licks or something because I'm not a licks player I don't really have licks I learned a couple of things like I learned a couple of things from everyone but I never really learned stuff note for note I tried to get to get a handle on somebody's approach you know uh and I you know my BB King was 80s BB King really that I love I mean I love all of it but that's what initially got me was stuff from the 80s and his play is very sophisticated so I was already hearing like the diminished scale uh from from bb before i knew who robin was if you see right so i never say this to discredit uh, how important robin is but sometimes that's other people's people's frames of reference that they listen to you through yeah and that's what they know and so it's i'm i'm probably broader than people realize because they haven't listened to what i have if you yeah. know what i mean or come yeah. up yeah it, um so so yeah and then you know i like i say i listen to a lot of not um guitar stuff so oscar peterson mm -hmm. not again not that i've ever i did try once to work out c jam blues on guitar and i was like okay it's too much hard work <laughs> um but i've never really been a transcriber i've been a listener and then a, a play with my own vocabulary and it might be like oh, i'll do something in that bag you know that kind of Albert Collinsy, but if you would have like superimposed the actual things I'm playing on top of, uh, or you know, or like lay them over their playing, it's not the same at all. It just makes you think of it, and I love that. I love when you listen to Stevie, you hear Albert King and Hendrix and Lonnie Mac. He's the guy that never gets any credit, but Stevie's right. a third Lonnie Mac. Yeah. Um, the conversation I had with Robin actually was 
him disagreeing with me uh, that he that you don't hear his, I said you don't hear your influences at all anymore Robin you just sound only like Robin Ford yeah. and there's not many guys that are that clear sounding do you know as yeah, yeah. John Schofield would be the other one yeah 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 uh, so you never hear Robin doing something Hendrixy, or no. you never hear Platini, which there was a yeah. little into that early on I thought he, he was arguing he thought that Eric Johnson was more like that. He holds Eric Johnson in incredibly high esteem, mm. and rightfully so. We all do. Another guy who's playing, I love. I've never tried to play like that, but I, I'm inspired by it. If you yeah. know what I mean. Yeah. But uh, he was saying Eric was more singular in voice, and I said, no, I can hear Eric doing a bit of Wes, bit of Jimmy, oh, yeah. bit of Chet Atkins, bit of Jeff Beck. You know, and of course, it sounds like Eric Johnson. Of course, yeah, yeah. So I feel I'm more like that. You know. Um, and and which I like, I like leaning because also like we say, I, I'm a product of everything that came before that I liked. Yeah. Fifty years ago or eighty years ago, there wasn't all it wasn't all done before, you know. So um, you can't help but be a product. So what do you end up sounding like when you love Lightning Hopkins and Eric Johnson? I mean, I I do that and Oscar Peterson and Miles Davis and the meters and dr yeah, john yeah. you know like yeah. all donny hathaway stevie wonder yeah, yeah. all of those things are equally important to me and i guess that's what ends up you just mash it all together and uh mainly just though it's uh the, the perspective i have about all of it is trying to sound like me sound genuine not play licks play speak using my vocabulary what comes to mind and improvise within my vocabulary say something but mainly i just want to make whoever's listening to me feel as much as i feel when i listen to my favorite guys whoever it is whether it's bb or oscar or stevie or robin or whatever uh they give that i have a visceral emotional mental and physical response to the music so I, that's my mainly what i'm trying to do is return that for me that i got you know and, and if i can uh make somebody you know be as uh, moved or I, in fact it's a very important not playing to impress people mm. um that i there's a lot of that these days of you know especially with social media and instagram and fake guitar videos or I, there's a lot of videos on instagram of people playing my solos note for note but not crediting me and they'll say here's a little jazz blues progression and i'm like i'm like that's that's mine that's yeah. that, that's the solo i improvised that you've right. learned and now you're presenting as as your own thing there's been a few of those right uh, it's rife with that but that's playing there's nothing in that for me there's no i'm not interested in that so instead of playing to impress people i want to play to make people feel good or have an experience so uh, anyway it's a very long answer you know but no that's... no not at all. <laughs> you touched on a, on a lot of things. i'm going to try and juggle all the things that you that you just triggered um i mean one thing talk thinking about licks it's kind of the the authority and the determination you you play with just shows that you're you're just in the game rather than somebody who's a student of it what i mean by that is thinking about that business of of learning licks or yeah. approaches there are a lot of people you i suppose it happens in jazz a lot but it happens in blues because things are athletic now there there is that social media judgment which is not that valid really but a lot of people gather other people's stuff only yes so they might steal licks from me they might steal licks from a few people put them together but yeah. they're basically totally happy to just nick everything from other people and yeah. put them together and that's a collation job and it, it seems to me you can i think you can hear that when somebody's doing the opposite which is what you're doing it's for real when you learn something you think well i could do this i could do that you're playing with the possibilities and you're you're thinking about fitting into the music. And yeah. Next to something else that I that I wanted to touch on. Just I mean, I, I do listen to you regularly, you know. It's like it's like it's, Thank you. it's it's a lovely kind of it's just not just the language, it's the flow. And here's here's where I'm going with this. Not 
everybody i'm talking about amongst professional players as that flow and that's born i think not of just of talent and study but you've got this amazing flow in your improvising. you start and you're going forward you're cooking something up and you can only do that if you're truly in the moment and have the yeah that stuff in the tank to do it you know that is really important to me the arc of something and again going back just touching briefly on like the idea of social media and i don't really post to it like playing clips because i don't feel that i really have something to offer in one minute what i have to offer happens over the course of 90 minutes right uh 10 12 13 of my original songs that all it's it's the entire thing so when i take a solo i'm soloing to take that tune somewhere and each solo in each song that we play is part of a bigger thing that I'm aiming for on the arc of the entire gig, mm. you know, the set list and, and the direction so that it's, it's all part of a, of, of a, some of an experience for me as well, you know, I like, I, but to say that it's that in my case is born of not being very good at memorizing stuff and um and uh certainly not being good at playing something the same way again on demand and i realized this very quickly i've told this story a few times but when i was about 19 i'd moved to london and i got put forward for a pop session because this other guitarist i knew he's like you're a good player you could do this it's good money you know go and and so i went to this producer's house up in like enfield or some up north somewhere and uh, it's just a really simple, like, D arpeggio part that he wanted me to play. And I didn't even realize I was putting, like, a little Hendrixy thing onto the D rhythm. And he's like, yeah, could you just not do that little um, flutter that you're doing? And I'm like, well, uh, yeah, just play it just straight. So I was just playing it how I thought sounded good on this tune. And in the end, he takes the guitar from me and he goes, yeah, I just meant, can you just play it like this? And I said, you know what? I don't want to waste your time. I'm, I'm, you should just play it yourself because I, I guess I'm just not the guy for this job. And so he said, oh, okay, I appreciate you, your honesty. And I said, he goes, let's go and have a coffee. I, I, you know, I didn't get paid. And I walked out of there and I was the, that I decided then, okay, that's going to be the last session I ever do until someone wants me to just play how I play and what I hear yeah. on the track. Right. So, um, and I realized then I'd be poorer, but maybe more fulfilled artistically. And so I just knew I just had to be me, you know, right. but for better or for worse. And um, so it was because I wasn't good at doing that. There's some guys, um, you know, who can do both. And uh, like Mike Landau mm. uh, can do both. He can play anything that is required of him on the dot you know sure. in the session and then just be mike landau but he's uh an incredible uh freak of nature in that respect and an amazing sure. person as well but um it, yeah it was but for me i couldn't do that so i kind of i guess you embrace your strengths or you're forced to yeah so. i guess i mean i'm sure it probably isn't even that it's, i'm sure you could do it if it was important to you you know what I mean? If it, yeah, well, definitely. I could have. You, you could do it. At this point, though, I haven't done it in so long. I ended up doing an Alma Brothers thing um, three nights in a row down at kind of the local venue where I live in Florida these days yeah. with a chap called Scott Sherrard, great guitarist, plays with Little Feet now, but he was Greg Allman's guitarist. And we oh. have one of the, uh, the percussionists from the Allman Brothers. And it was like a kind of a, not a tribute, but, you know, like it was a, uh, a night, three nights in a row, we played the first three Allman Brothers records in their entirety oh, for, the, wow. for these concerts to New Year's Eve. It was like a New Year's thing. Nice. And I'm not sure exactly why I'd been asked to do it, because other than, you know, um, I knew some of the guys and it was my kind of local place, because I don't really have much. I'm not an Allman Brothers guy, you know, I don't dislike them, but I certainly had I'd never listened to these records in their entirety. Mm -hmm. Um and after I, I sat there for about two weeks trying to learn these double guitar parts, you know, and I was like, I was really regretting saying yes to the gig because I hadn't had to learn anything. No, for, I've just played for 20 years since I've had my own band, 20 years this year since we recorded my first little live record. 
I've done whatever I please, you know, and just played whatever comes out on my own music. And uh, so, man, that was hard work because, of course, the less you do it over over time, the the harder it is to play somebody else's stuff. So um, it was it was good. It was a good uh, exercise to have to navigate. But I was regretting it at one point. Going, I'm, how am I? How the hell am I going to learn three records of all these harmonized guitars? <laughs> you know? It's funny how you get these challenges, and somehow everything comes out, doesn't it? I remember a drummer saying that to me. He said, "You know, I forget what we were learning." It's like you know, you know, it's going to work out, don't you? It's like yeah, and we had we had yeah. fun, uh, you know, uh, in the end, and it was it was good to be taken out of your your comfort zone, you know. But yeah. my idea of taking get, getting out of my comfort zone is going and playing with uh, good local blues players uh, on a you know on a little quiet gig somewhere uh, that I won't publicize, just so I can just play on like um entirely uh so i do this quite a bit at home you know i'll just go play with some local guys not necessarily even singing i'll just be the guitar player in the band so i can just blow um over some blues and that way i can really hear how i'm sounding at the moment right. um, in the moment because on your own music you know and it, like we, when we do ronnie's on friday we're doing two shows which is always a bit nerve-wracking for me because i'm a one-take guy in as much as if i have to play the same thing again I I need to have had a night's sleep before it. I'm, otherwise, I feel like I'm copying myself, and so right. I'm going to have to erase the memory of the first gig to go out there and play. We're going to mix up the sets a bit, but we want to, everybody to get some stuff, you know. Um, so it's, that's always a bit daunting because I got to go out there and do this all again, and it's like a one-time deal for me. Yeah, yeah. Each gig. Yeah. Um, but um, I can't remember why I'm saying that now. It's uh, yeah, it's just. Um, that's just how it comes out, though. You know, yeah. I just have to play what comes out. You well, know? I, that's, I think it's only a strength, and that's got to be a factor in that forward motion you have when you're improvising. I mean, I wonder how much that all thinking about all that other stuff does it get in the way of the creativity? I, I, I remember a friend of mine who's a really good jazz player who does a lot of sessions saying, well, I really like the challenge of being put under that kind of pressure, but. I don't know. I mean, it happens on gigs. I, I played with Van Morrison for a year, and my wife had done it just before me, and then she'd stopped doing it, and then I started doing it. And I started off playing the way I was playing. I was playing, like, you know, my usual bag of tricks, whatever the hell that is, you know, like post-Stevie, well, that's a bit arrogant, so, you know, Stevie influence kind of, sure. uh, whatever, you know, modern blues. And I was playing up here, and it's like, yeah, can you not play those high notes? It's like, can you do this go like that far? It's like, <laughs> okay yeah then it's like can you not play quite that high it's, and then he's like can you play only as far as that and i get on my i came on and told my wife it's like what's this she was saying be careful be careful because you're going to end up making a record people are going to think you just can't play the guitar yeah right they, yeah. they're going to think you've got no ideas no skills no knowledge because it's been constricted to the point where it's, it's not how you play do you re is it he, you'd think it was a credit to play with a big artist but is it really a credit when you've been put in such a small yeah you've box been kind of like an idiot restrained yeah yeah it's tricky it's tricky and I, I yeah I I don't do that much stuff for anybody else you know not that I wouldn't it not that it wouldn't be something you know um if if Doyle Bramall couldn't do it and Eric called I'd probably say yes to a tour do you know what I mean that but, would be a great fit by the way that that would be like, yeah you know, I'd be up for good. that but I haven't had any calls like that and there's not that many artists um that that need me in, in their band on guitar if you know what I mean it's there's not like, many artists who know that they need you yet maybe but I also understand that how I play you know it's like my I I'm not the guy that's going to play the perfect uh, one chorus solo in the pop song, you know? It's like, yeah. I, I, I also, like we're talking about the arc and the run-up, to, to get to what I am all about, I need the pla I need the launch pad to go, you know? So there's a pacing, and yeah. again, from 20 years of now doing my own stuff, that pace is a certain pace, you know? So um, much like, you know, Eric Clapton, I did a record with... Uh, my anything but time record with producer John Porter, who uh, is a wonderful human being and great producer mm. and engineer. But he used to do a lot of stuff with Eric Clapton back in the days. And he said, that's what he said about Eric is, 
he's always got pacing in his solo he's always you know it's it always just gets there in the right way you know and uh so that i always think about that and uh also see i've, I've listened to a lot more old blues than people probably realize i don't really listen to contemporary blues rock and stuff do you know what i mean mm. i'm um i'm actually much more of a uh classic music listener in that old jazz and blues right. and uh those guys they just never did anything stupid bb king never does anything stupid. he never just goes for a lick because he's just yeah, learned yeah. his latest it, 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 they speak you know louis armstrong or something he just doesn't do anything stupid That's it's right. just perfect little Amazing. thing so yeah. um it's uh that's that's what i'm interested in and uh i guess um i guess yeah it's hard to find someone else's context to do that in you know or artists that i could have are no longer with us it's just music's just different now you know yeah, so yeah. Yeah. eric's eric's uh still going of course i'm probably not going to end up in the rolling stones maybe i could play for someone like joe cocker or something you know that's kind of bluesy or something like he's that. he's gone he's gone exactly he's oh, gone. Yeah. so i mean every, there's nobody really um i don't i don't know man you just know? jog my memory that mentioned joe cocker this is a bit lateral um years ago i was doing this educational project and uh they said can you do a very and a, a solo gu a guitar and voice version of kind-hearted woman blues by Robert Johnson. I checked it out. I, I obviously we all listened to Robert Johnson, but I'd never sat down and thought, "What is it? You know, what? How does it work?" I never tried to play any. I never tried to figure out exactly what it was. And I, I checked that out. And I thought, I, I just can't sell it. It's just it does. It sounded so particular as a thing. I thought, well, I tell you what, I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to come up with an arrangement. I thought, well, how am I going to do it? And I thought it was in a sort of male key, so I wasn't. I couldn't ask my wife to do it. And I thought because of the nature of the song the words don't really suit a woman anyway so i asked mike finnegan do you know who yeah he is? mike died a couple of years ago yeah amazing he was one of my greatest heroes and i i'd gone in touch with him and he said yeah i'll do it in the end he did two things i did this duo version of kind-hearted woman blues and we also did a cover of um all along the watchtower and i i did a long slow very 60s vampy intro prior to the jimmy type arrangement of it but anyway this you jog my memory um going back you, you're talking about the the diminished scale thing yeah that was amazing to me to check out robert johnson whilst he doesn't fill out the scale so much it's more like chordal things yeah that diminished thing i'm sure you know much better than i do but it's a huge part of that language isn't it the diminished well, it is. on one chord it's like what it's, it's really strident stuff you know yeah i mean well there's a lot of harmony contained within a 12 bar blues progression that kind of got actually lost over the years that was played yeah. much more when you go back well if you go back way back to when blues and jazz weren't really different things they were just all uh music of black americans in the south in the u.s you know then um you get a lot more harmony that would is is in there, and as it becomes more like blues rock, and the Brits in the sixties take over, then it gets whittled down to three chords. But yeah. you know, it, like in a slow blues, um, there's a lot of two fives happening inside the harmony, you know, and you can all the time because it's dominant seventh chords. I mean, there's it's a lot to get into here, and without a guitar in my hands, but that that harmony presents melodies that are, are um, available to you even then when you take away those chords, if you know what I mean. So yeah. there are spots that uh, a diminished chord works in a uh, 12-bar blues yeah, yeah. perfectly because it, you're just superimposing or implying the diminished chord that is there but not being played by the yeah. by the backing. So, yeah, it's, it can be as colourful as you as you want it to be and as i say if you listen to some 80s bb king the, the video i had as a kid was in live in newcastle um again yeah from the thing from the tube and somebody just put up a good quality version um i'm in my my uh, mum's house right now and for probably somewhere in the loft there's the actual vhs cassette um but um um it's uh it's on youtube again and it, he's dropping a lot of sophisticated lines and he was using diminished arpeggios and things um 
because Django Reinhardt was one of his big influences, you know, and uh, you think, well, the king of the blues, his heroes, two of his biggest heroes, were the two great jazz guitarists of the time, Charlie Christian and, and Django Reinhardt. So, again, it's almost like those things are more closely related uh, 80, 90 years ago. And then as it becomes uh, rock and roll and then British blues, you lose some of the harmony and the melody then, and it becomes more pentatonic sounding yeah. playing and music. But uh, before that, it was very colorful and very, you know, they like say even Robert Johnson's uh, dropping diminished and, and things like that. And also playing the changes. So BB played the changes as well. Albert King played the changes. He did it by bending the notes, but he's right. playing out of the tonality of the chords yeah. by bending it to find those notes. It's not just a pentatonic being blasted over whatever's behind it, regardless of whether it fits properly. Yeah. They're melodic and it's all, it's all properly harmonically, um, you know, fits together. And um, so I like stuff that sounds like that, you know, so. That's what you sound like, you know, I mean, it's like <laughs> trying <laughs> navigating the changes. I mean, one thing, what, how do I put it? Um, I don't, I, I don't want to, ask you to talk too technically uh, you know in this in the in this context but thinking about the key points in the blues that the the areas where there's divergent and all i'm thinking really you know like how much blues do you play on the one chord how many major thirds do you play on the one chord what do you do on the four chord how do you outline if you want to the five chord how often do you not play the you know state the five mm. but it makes me think just in in line with what you just said i think a lot of people really are learning how music works from YouTube videos these days. I see that a lot. For sure. A lot of kids, and I'm not sure that's healthy because a lot of people think you just wail on the minor pentatonic on a major blues and, and you're off to the races. Well, for sure. You know, this, that's such a primitive thing. And they're like the fourth, the note, the, the fourth note is pretty horrible, really, unless you, unless you can really sell it. For it yeah. To, and the other elephant in the room. It's weird, you know. Yeah, the other elephant in the room, and I find this on on teaching camps that I do or clinics or master classes and stuff, is using your ears. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's the elephant in the room because, like yeah. you say, people are learning from YouTube videos. And um, as my friend Tomo Fujita from the, the the professor at Berkeley College of Music, an incredibly gifted teacher, mm. uh, pointed out that there's too much information now and not enough knowing how to use it you know and uh that's something that um i think he also explained well i listened to him do a clinic that it's it's better to understand what you're doing than try and memorize information and apply it you know so um that goes back to right where we started i wasn't good at memorizing I tried to figure out what was going on and then yeah. be able to do something like that by understanding what was happening, but not memorizing anything really particularly. Um, and uh, so all this information now, but nobody gets together then with the band in the garage like we did or up at school. In my case, we, we were lucky enough to have a great music teacher. Not that I took uh, the music classes properly, but he understood that we were good. And so he would let us use the, the, the music uh, room after school every night and all day at the weekend to just jam with the band. Right. You got to sound good to play with the band. It's no good to have learn your new thing off your YouTube video if when you get together with the band, it doesn't fit what, what yeah. you're, the songs you're trying to play. Yeah. So the elephant in the room now is, 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 it's like everybody's using every other sense they have available to them to play music other than there is the you know it's like the, where do you put your fingers i'm watching my fingers i've learned you know scale shapes but I, I keep saying this all the time all that information does not give you any music it just gives you information just numbers yeah 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 and uh it's what does it sound like yeah. or more even more importantly what do you want to sound like yeah. you know what do you yeah. What sound are you trying to get out of the instrument? And uh, so it's not an out, to me, the guitar is not an out there thing. Um, uh, it's a, it's an in you thing. And, and again, right about where we started with Hendrix. And then the guitar is just a medium 
a tool to get the music out of you. It's your chosen tool and to be explored and, and it's an adventure, you know, and yeah. uh, and to not be afraid of. But, but you tell it what to do. The yeah. scales don't tell you what to do. Yeah. You tell the guitar what to do. So, um, And I hope people can get to that point because uh, it's wonderful. It's the, the freedom of having enough command of an instrument to stand there and then play with other human beings to, to feel and to make something, create something together in the moment. It's my favorite thing. That's what I do and that's what I live for. So um, I hope people, I always say that, uh, you know, clinics and things like even if you've just got a, um, a, a mate that also plays guitar getting together and just just sitting on a riff I don't even mean either of you soloing if you're just starting out playing and you're just getting into this just see how locked in and grooving you can get it because the fit when the when my band really locks into that groove it's like my drummer Evan of many years who'd be playing with me this weekend uh, he, he calls it sound wave surfing, but it's like when you when you hit that thing as a band and everybody's just it's like you're flying at an altitude yeah. uh, and you've got it you've you've or you've caught the wave and then you ride it as long as you can. Yeah, there's nothing like that, and you know, so no YouTube videos um, or even you know, I don't want to dissuade anybody from going and buying my true fire courses because they should they should they should yeah. and there's a lot of good information in yeah. in those uh and there's some really great backing tracks and backing tracks are another thing see everybody plays to backing tracks but it's a static thing where nobody's going to turn around and go dude you suck or you know like yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah. <laughs> shut up um uh, like they would if you're on the gig and uh, somebody else's band and you're and you're stinking up the place. So it's, it's a very different thing, and I've also experienced it on gigs where, you know, Instagram type players have come along and they want to sit in. I'm like, right, come on up. And in the context of getting up and doing a blues shuffle or especially a slow blues, they got nothing, and yeah. yet they've got two hundred thousand followers on on the. Instagram and they're posting videos daily of here's how to play a slow blues. Oh, come and play a slow blues. Yeah. Oh, you can't. Yeah, yeah. It's it's, yeah. it's so it's I'm not being disparaging to anyone. I'm just making fun at this point. But uh, it's a different thing. It like, is. I mean, it, um, it, it, this relates to what. Sorry to interrupt. This relates yeah. to what you were saying earlier about building something over the course of a gig. Yeah. I mean, not, obviously, you do it within each tune. You're building something, mm -hmm. and as I say, the forward flow. But it's a totally different intent, isn't it? You're a professional. You're an artist. You're a it's professional just a different thing. And artist. increasing, yeah, increasingly, I use that word, uh, which I, I, I'd never felt like I needed to before. But to say, you know, some people are artists, mm. regardless. Mm. And I'm going to do this anyway. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's. I didn't do it for success, just as well, or money, just as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> I did it because I need to do it. And yeah. I, how I play is how I want to play. And uh, uh, I've been playing 33 years properly this time, a little bit longer than that messing around. But I mean, I, I did my first gig 32 years ago this year. So let's say that, you know, yeah. and ever since longest break I ever had was COVID. Oh, yeah. yeah. Two years. I, I hadn't not done a gig for that long. So um, it's just what I do. I, there's no even separation between that and who i am at this point do you, i, I no, mean yeah. since i was 13 years old it's, yeah 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 it, you don't it's not it's just what i do some guy the, the thing lovely guy and he, he was asking but how do you he was talking about the pacing of the solos and there's this outro solo of mine on a song called clean break and he's like but how do you get for that long that solo and it's a long song how how, how do you do that and i'm like it's what I do. It's like asking a Michelin star chef why his food is so much better than mine. You know, it's like I can't cook. Some yeah. people can cook. Yeah. It, so th that's what I do. And uh, sometimes that's a surprise to people these days. Do you know what I mean? They're like, yeah, it's not sure I hadn't really what... thought about that as yeah. though they should be able to do it as yeah. well. Yeah. But it's okay to not. I, there's loads of things that I enjoy that I can't do as well as the the people that do it, and I can just enjoy it. And you yeah, know? but it's that short termist thing. And if you're talking about yeah. Instagram video, okay, what you got in a minute? Yeah. But if you put all those minutes together, ninety minutes of those minutes, 
might not be the most pleasurable experience. No, nobody's that. no. And, um, you know, many of the big YouTube channels as well of guitar stuff, it's mostly gear, isn't it? You know, yeah, yeah. but there's, there's people, these people, it's an excellent resource for certain stuff, but yeah. they're not making any music ever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just playing guitar. Yeah. And so, again, everyone, I, I wish only the best for and to. Uh, it's not said in, with anything other than that. But uh, I just don't relate to it myself. Let's put it that way, you know? Yeah, yeah. i tell you what, one thing, I, I, I'll, I'll let you get back to it in a minute, but what, one thing I'd like to ask you, right-hand picking. Mm. How much of a blend do you find um, you you have between picking and using the flesh of your fingers i tell you why i'm thinking of it years ago um i went to nashville to do a few interviews and my it's an excuse really but i did a few interviews and one of them was with vince gill i went around with my missus went oh yeah it's amazing yes. and he had one of his 54 tellies just into what was it i think it was a 59 basement he had and just the tone that he makes with his fingers and I'd had a similar experience also in Nashville of doing the same thing with Larry Carlton and you know those one of those little writing rooms that yeah. Nashville types get just a little place in the country and hearing Larry Carlton just play on his own into that Steely Dan app with his guitar oh yeah and not many people can really make that sound you've got that I mean I'm talking about the 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 best relationship with the guitar it's like it's that beautiful the sound you make with your fingers well of course you how much of the uh, what's the blend between pick and fingers do you think pick uh quite a bit and it varies sometimes if i've not done a few gigs for a while and i've just been noodling at home i'll go on the gig and go well you play barely play with your fingers at all tonight you know you just get at it because it, because none of it's a conscious thing for me either it's all looking for sounds and whatever makes the sound so there's not like a set way i play a song that i always use my pick or fingers here or and i'm not like my friend josh smith you know is an incredible hybrid uh picker in the kind of that kind of country style or also uh, uh david grissom who uh, i've got to work with on many I did an interview with days and you watch him his picking i mean that's like that is a fundamental part of his style is the hybrid picking thing. Mine is just more uh, of a whimsical, like, I think I'll use my fingers here and, and not. It's not, do you know what I mean? But my, all my, yeah, and all my playing is like that. Any technique that I have at all is a byproduct of trying to play some musical idea that I have. So never in my life, maybe I should have, uh, but I just that's not what's interested me never in my life have I sat there and just practice the technique for technique's sake mm. uh, I'd rather you know go to the pub or something you know it just it, that's not interesting to me M only music is interesting so yeah. it's like whatever it takes to get the music out is what I end up developing uh, and so I don't think about it that much and sometimes or, or more I'm more likely to think about it when I'm like why didn't you you barely use your fingers tonight because you've got out of a habit even like if i've not been on the road for two weeks um so then i'll go home after that tour and not pick up a pick for ages when i'm just sat around on the couch do you know what i mean and try and like yeah re-instigate that as a potential idea to draw on so it changes it like it yeah there's periods where i use my fingers a lot more um but uh quite a lot for rhythm it i i'm quite often you know plucking so, all the strings at once, more like, you know, so you get more of a piano yeah. effect where all the notes not strummed. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Um, that kind of thing. And then, you know, the kind of bluesy uh, attack, pulling at the strings, something like that. You know? yeah. Um, yeah. But it's just, it's all tone stuff, really. And and like you mentioned, uh, it you know, the other elephant in the room, aside from not using your ears to play music, is um, that... Uh, I, I know everybody knows the tone and is in the fingers argument versus the gear. Yeah. And of course I love my two rocks and, and my SVL guitars and my old 61 Strat, but uh, I do sound more the same than on anything. Sure. I've just been flying around in Europe this month and uh, with no two rocks to be found, you know, so uh, I, I, I have to, get it out of whatever sat on the stage's backline and, and uh it 
no one would know really except me or you know people who have come expecting to see a two rock but it's um it starts with how you play in fact we were even talking, I was talking to mike goodman about um and, and some people at the at the camp of uh i have the best tone after a long tour when my callus is in really good tour shape yeah yeah which you can't get sitting at home there's no replacement for two hours of adrenaline fueled wailing right. every night yeah. you know any amount it's just different it's just different yeah and uh so when you get really good tour fingers the notes just sound better on the fret do you yeah. know what I mean? because then yeah. you've got that yeah, much yeah. more thickness of callus and it's nice and solid and uh you're getting a better note out of the guitar so uh it, it's just things like that is you, you're inextricably linked to the, the instrument particularly the guitar i mean that's that's the beauty of it is and why it's so expressive um, yeah. and uh so i tone isn't an idea that exists in isolation of playing to me it's not you know they're not separable in any way and, and often you know, a lot of my favorite tones if anyone else was playing that rig other than the person who i hear it with it wouldn't sound good at all. So it's it's you know like the Stevie Ray, the El Macambo, uh, is an incredible one of my favorites. Old Strat, Chief Screamer, yeah, super reverb, vibe reverb, really simple, yeah. And it's just devastating when Stevie's playing. You know, listen to the Texas Flood from that. Yeah. But that if somebody else picked that up, it would just not sound like that. And the main reason the tone is so good is because his playing is so good. Yeah, yeah. So what you're often hearing is uh actually somebody playing really well which comes back to the old joke uh i think it was Jack who said it first but we say it all the time when someone comes up and goes man that guitar sounds good and you put it down on the table and say oh really how's it sound now you yeah. know oh you mean when i was playing it or all the time in the two rock man those two rocks sound great and i'm like oh oh you mean when i was playing through right they don't make a sound yeah. until you play music through it yeah, you know? yeah. so it's it's of course I love the the nice stuff, but it's oh, uh, sure. you have to also just finally on terms to say, and it's about having an idea of what you want it to sound like as well. It's not it also just like the scales don't give you the the music on their own. Yeah. The gear doesn't give you the tone on its own. You know you have to know what you're searching for out of it as well. You know so yeah, uh, everything's more holistic than than it's often thought of these days. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that when I first heard you, heard you use the two, two, two experiments, actually. One, mm. you did a workshop at the ACM, I was like donkeys years ago. And then I saw you play at the Jazz Cafe. And as soon as, as you started playing, it's like amazing play and great touch. Um, and my wife turned to me and said, what's that overdrive pedal he's using? <laughs> I won't drop you. I won't make it. I won't say anything awkward over brands, but I got one of those. I have a relationship with that company you were working with at that point. And I, I've been using that today, that pedal. Nice. It's just a pedal. It doesn't, it's not like the Matt Schofield pedal. You plug yeah. it in. I sound like, I, you know, I can't, it is what it is. It's just a nice sound. And it's the same with the Turok. It's another palette of sounds, but it is. You, know, you could play through, I don't know, a nice JTM 45 kind of thing, and you could get a great sound of it. You get a super reverb. As long as you've got a great tone, you'll sound good. But I bet you wouldn't sound that much different through a, like a JTM 45 or something. I don't. And, but and it's a character, it, isn't it? The two in fact, is, yeah, this character is more, for me, it's more about, um, well, oftentimes the, the choice of what I'm playing through is dictated by logistics and the realities of touring. So, yeah. I mean, if, if I had my way with the world, <laughs> if I, you know, could carry around whatever I wanted, yeah. it would be quite different. But I don't. So often it's like dictated by the best thing I can get hold of at that point, you know, yeah. or whatever I can take with me or um, and uh and then there's things that are more important than the type of amp for me it would be like the headroom and knowing how it responds and not have, if I don't have enough headroom, I'm doomed. You know, I, I'm a high headroom player so I can have full dynamic range because yeah. I don't play flat out all the time. You know, I'm, I'm constantly on the volume control is my, one of my other tone controls on the guitar. So, um, to come up against the ceiling of headroom when I need to carry on 
in within my own dynamic range is a nightmare so it's 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 those kind of things you know or there's there's lots of amps you know i've had situations where someone's brought their two rock head for me to borrow when i've been traveling but i've hated the speakers and it's the no. speakers are what you're actually listening to at no, the yeah. last moment before it hits your ears and mm. stuff like that you know so uh, i just did we were at a festival in hungary for four days and it was all fantastic vintage fender backline all super reverbs um and uh vibralux deluxe you know all the classics twins but real real black face and silver face good silver face because not all the silver face are good yeah. but unfortunately they i i love those amps as much as anything in the world as long as i can change the speakers and then so it's like oh this would be so good through some different speakers yeah. so it's like all that stuff but uh you know what there's some videos of me in hungary uh, last month and uh even at the time I was cursing the speakers, it sounds, I heard a couple of clips. I'm like, yes, sounds like me. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. As it would do, as you say, you know. Yeah. Listen, man, th I, I don't want to take any more of your time. No, I, it's a pleasure, mate. No pleasure. No problem. Really kind of you to take the time. And uh, thanks for the inspiration. I, hopefully I'll see you later on in the year. But Yes, I hope so. Thanks, uh, I, I've had a really nice day uh, practicing this slow blue solo. So just thanks for that, apart from everything else. Oh, all right. And if anybody's watching this and you haven't checked out, obviously Matt's True Fire stuff is, if you like that kind of music, as you really should, if you've got a guitar, you should get Matt's uh, True Fire stuff, but also the Hal Leonard DVD is amazing. And please buy his records. I'm much, I'm much younger and slimmer on the uh, Hal Leonard DVD. That's a long time ago now, so don't hold that against me. We all get old, don't we? So. Yeah, man, you're nowhere near old. It's going to be a long while. <laughs> <Get in there. laughs> but uh, right, Andy. thanks for your time, Matt. Really lovely. Pleasure, mate. All the best. I'll see you I'll later. See you out there somewhere. Bye. Peace. Thanks Cheers. Ta-da. Bye. <laughs>